It's the economy is an economy of bondage. People are enslaved to what man has made. Think of any, any movie where you create the machine and the machine kills the humans, that's it already. It's not science fiction, it's here. This is the world, we all inhabit it. We're breathing in it and we're feeling it. Were we created only to be in bondage to these man-made structures? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallama ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima tu'allimuna. وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Our topic of exploration today is about Islam and the moral economy. Talking about the economy is a very, 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 very big topic. But at the same time, it actually concerns each and every one of us. Because an economy ultimately governs how we deal with each other. When we talk about Islam and the economy, we're actually learning about us, ourselves, as human beings. What does it mean to be human on this earth? How do human beings interact with each other? What's our relationship with nature? What's our relationship with the environment? And how is all of this under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the topic is grand in, in scope, but it's actually very, very essential. And what I'd like to do with you all today is to just take a few snippets, few snippets as points of thought, points of departure for us, as we learn and think about ourselves as human beings on this planet. And the summary of everything we're going to be seeing ultimately is that the vision of how it means to exist as a human being in an economy under the teachings of Allah and His Messenger, it's a vision which gives primacy to the human, a dignified human being. That is what Allah and His Messenger are preserving in this teaching. And the opposite we'll be contrasting with is the supremacy of the material. So what you're going to be seeing is, do you want a world which believes the human being is dignified and purposeful, or do you want a world of bondage when everyone is enslaved to the non-human, to the material? And we're going to flesh out this idea just a little bit in our conversations today. How we're going to explore this today, we'll have some discussions from the Holy Quran, but the place where Muslims will be discussing and talking about an economy, a way of dealing with money, with wealth, with ownership, with transactions, it's in the Islamic discipline of fiqh. And fiqh in Arabic is a word that means deep understanding. And it's a sacred, beautiful, and fundamental discipline of the Islamic tradition, which is ultimately extending the sunnah. Fiqh is a discipline where we understand what is the sunnah of our messenger, والسلام, and how does it extend? How can we learn from it everything we need to know of how to live in this earth? In the fiqh tradition, our scholars have statements. We call them mas'alas, questions, small points. They'll talk about things like if you have a bucket and you collect rain, do you own the water? We'll talk about that today. You're driving by, you see a cucumber on the road, do you have to pick it up? That's fiqh. It's little, little questions. It's not grand theories. It's little, little points of the law. For those of us who have not studied fiqh today, this might be a very interesting uh, presentation then, because we're going to look at little, little bits of the law. And through the little, little bits of the law, we're going to construct a picture, an understanding of how our ulama, the fuqaha, the people of deep understanding of this religion, how they understood what it means to be a human being in the world economically. And when I talk about economically again, all I really mean to say is how we live together in a society. So society, community, family, human ties, all of this is the subject of this human and moral economy under the teachings of Allah and His Messenger. And what I want to, us to take away from today as well is just the sanctity of what it means to transact. When you look at the Quran and the Sunnah, as we'll be showing today, 
transacting is a sacred activity. I'll be reciting a verse to you which will imply the sun and the moon move the way they do so we can transact. It's a very, very strange thing. Our interactions with each other are sacred. The notion of owning wealth is sacred. The idea of trade is sacred. And as we understand the sanctity of this, we'll understand how it's important to remember Allah and his messenger in all of these dealings. Now, two introductions before I go into my atomized pictures of the law, two introductions I want to share. One is about society, and one is just something from the Quran. The thing about society that I wish to share is that the Prophet والسلام, his migration from Mecca to Medina starts our calendar. And there's a reason for this. There's a reason why the companions considered that migration as the beginning of our calendar, because that migration marked what you can call the beginning of an Islamic civilization, an Islamic order in the world. The Prophet والسلام, in the year or so before the migration, he went on his night journey. And this night journey was incredibly, uh, was an incredible event, incredibly symbolic. He went to Jerusalem, alayhi salatu wasalam. He led the prophets in prayer. He ascended to the heavens. He went beyond where every, any human, any being, any being can go in closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that was not the end of his mission. That was the beginning of this next stage. And so what is the teachings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah? It is to imbue this deep closeness to Allah in this world, in our ties with each other. Because there is a plan for this world, which is why man came to earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفًا He said to the angels, I'm going to place on this earth a representative. And so we have a job on earth. And the teachings of the Sunnah, the beginning of our calendar, marks this job. This deeply spiritual, the greatest of beings, alayhi salatu wasalam, on earth, establishing society, building the economy, making a way for human beings to live dignified. And that's what Medina represents. The books of fiqh, or the tradition of fiqh, you could say it's a map of Medina. Just like you make a map of Medina that's physical. Here is the Prophet's mosque, alayhi salatu salam. There is the Rauda. You turn this way, you go towards Quba. You turn, there's a, there are geographical maps of Medina. And there are, you could say, legal. You could say moral. You could say a moral mapping of Medina. That's what it means to study this fiqh tradition. And I hope from the little atoms we'll discuss, you'll get an inspiration to study more of this beautiful, profound and deep teaching of what it means to map Medina onto the world. Because our job as Muslims is to map Medina wherever you go, wherever you've gone. Every civilization, every Khalifa across time has gone to Medina, lowered their heads and said, Salamu alayka ya Rasulallah, and drew for that inspiration for what they had to do. Every jurist, every leader. And we have to do that in our time. Physically, and spiritually, and in every way, to say, as salatu wassalamu alayka, ya Rasulallah, I thank Allah for your blessing, I'm going to be true to what you've brought. That is the fiqh tradition. And it's little atoms of that that I wish us to reflect upon today, as we ultimately understand what it means to live as humans on this planet. Our Prophet, alayhi salatu wassalam, when he went to Medina, he established two institutions immediately. The first thing he established was his mosque. And this mosque is the most important institution. We'll talk a little bit about this mosque. A mosque is a space of land no human being owns, and it's dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A mosque is an equalizing space. It tells people whatever your color, your ethnicity, your language, your wealth status, in this space you bow together as one. You stand in a line, and what unifies you is your commitment to Allah and His Messenger. Mosque creates ummah, mosque creates community. The first thing he constructed was his mosque, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the second thing he established was the market. He established a piece of land that would be the free market. Anyone can come and trade. There's no fees, there's no fines, as long as you follow the rules of fair trade. And there was an inspector who would ensure there was fair trade within this market. Anyone could come, anyone could trade, and it had to be fair, it had to be equal access. So you already are seeing the vision of Rasulullah 
which is there's no sacred and non-sacred. Being a human being is engaging in sacred activity. There's a spirit in you the angels are told to bow to. That, in, that entails there's something sacred in being human, and the Rasul is showing us what it means to be a sacred human in the world, and what it means for this world to realize its purpose, if you like, through us, as Allah's representatives on this earth. Now to do just two Quranic verses, one is the verse I've started with, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, I am placing a representative on earth. We represent Allah on this earth for a purpose. And the Sharia is showing us the detailing of that purpose. Something about our economic activity, there's a beautiful phrase that the Holy Quran uses many, many times to refer to human economic activity. Whether we mean by this, going into the earth and bringing forth its resources, or whether we mean trade, human to human. That beautiful Quranic phrase is, Al-ibtigha min fadlillah. Seeking out the bounty of Allah. And there's two verses which are very beautiful. I'll read in translation. Uh, Surah An-Nahl, verse 14. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is he who made the sea subject to you, O human, that you might eat from this sea this beautiful fresh flesh, bring forth from this sea ornaments through which you decorate yourself. Allah did that for you. And you see the ships going over the sea. Why? So you might seek of his bounty. Allah's given all of this so we'd engage in this beautiful, sacred activity of going into the sea, harvesting its fruits, and then replenishing and creating human society. That's a beautiful thing, and that's why this world was made the way it was. Another beautiful and even more impressive or shocking almost verse. In Surah Al-Isra, Allah SWT says, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ آيَتَيْنَ We made the day and the night two signs. وَجَعَلْنَا آيَتَيْنَ فَمَحَوْنَا آيَةَ اللَّيْلِ وَجَعَلْنَا آيَةَ النَّهَارِ مُبْصِرًا We made the sign of the night, this sort of covering over darkness, and we made the sign of the day a thing which enables you to see. Aye? So that's the day for activity, a night with its tranquility. Why this? What's the reason for day and night? لِتَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ That you might go out and seek the bounty of your Lord. And that, so even therefore, the heavens are there to facilitate our activity as human beings to interact with each other in sacred activity. And part of that is how we replenish and nurture our societies. And that you might know the, the day and the night, and, that, and we made all of our signs extremely clear. So this is just some indications from the Holy Qur'an about what I'm going to call the sacred nature of our human economy. And if it's sacred, we have to respect it. And that means respecting each other. Because at the heart of it, like I said, it's the dignity of the human being. That's what this whole teaching is about. Respecting and evalu evaluating the human being in all of our interactions. Now, I'm going to go into my little, little explorations now from the fiqh tradition. Small points, very quick surveys, from which we're going to draw some basic lessons, and in the end we're going to draw a little bit of a picture. And we'll reflect on our world, and we'll see where we can go from here, uh, inshallah ta'ala. And my little explorations, which will be God willing short, are in four areas. It's not encompassing at all. One is just the first point, because it has to start from there. The right to owning nature. That your relationship with the world and your right to own it, to ownership. Just a few t topics from there I want to look at. The next thing I want to look at is uh, uh, in the area of social responsibility. When you own something, do you own it completely the way you want, or are you actually responsible for something with what you own? A few interesting discussions on social responsibility. The third one, very, very short reflections of a very large topic, which is about government. What role should government have in a human economy? Little, little points uh, of a much larger topic. And the last one is about financial exchanges person to person. And there's three points here that are of interest to me. The basic way you interact is you exchange a thing for a thing, which is trade. So what are some basic insights into trade in this moral economy? Of, of, of the sacred law. The next thing is charity. 
Now, charity is highly recommended, and it's the beginning of Islam till the end. The beginning of the Quran till the end is an urging to charity in many, many ways. In the law tradition, we talk in the fiqh tradition, the charity which you have to give is zakat. There's a little bit of how zakat can be read in the lines of the other things we're discussing today. And the last thing I will have to talk about to finish this picture is about riba, because riba is the anti-zakat, and riba is the anti-moral economy. And it's our segue into contrasting the present with the past. And then we'll do our conclusions. Uh, very good. So, little, little, little journeys in the world of, of, of the fiqh tradition. So water is free that falls from the rain. Water that falls from the sky is free, meaning it comes to, to everyone. If I put a bucket on a roof and I collect water in it, What's the status of that water? Our fiqh scholars say the status of that water is, it's mine, I own it now. Why do I own it? Because I took some effort to gather it. And whatever is in nature, everyone can own. If you take effort to own it, it's yours. I have the right to sell this water. I have the right to, 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 to make some profit off of this water. If somebody takes a glass out of my bucket without my permission, they're stealing. They're morally, it's a morally reprehensible act because I owned it. It was free in nature, but when I put my hand on it, it was mine. It's a fundamental fact. Every human being, as part of being a dignified human being, you have the right to own what you put your hand on in what is free nature. That's part of what the Quran was indicating as saying this was made for us and we are here for a purpose. I'll give you another interesting uh, side point. Um, an egg gets, uh, a, a bird lays an egg in the garden of your neighbor. Who owns that egg? So our jurist said, if the neighbor has closed the gates and it's an enclosed space, the neighbor has taken some effort to own this piece of nature. And if they haven't done that, then whoever takes the egg is the owner of the egg. And the point of this is to show again, whatever is free in nature, humans can own, but we have to respect anyone's attempt to take ownership of it. If you look at, for example, animals, hunting, a human being can own any creature which is hunted, and there's no blame or blemish in this, rather this is sacred activity. Allah's created, the, created nature for this purpose. But what is forbidden in this is cr hunting creatures for sport. You have no right or agency or permission to take life for pleasure. No human being has the right to take life for pleasure. But if it's for a, the advantage of human society, this is a valid and legal form of ownership. So that's all I'm going to say here. Step number one is Islamic, the Islamic laws respect and recognition that you can own what is in nature. You have a right to that, and whatever you own, you can sell, and no one can take it from you. That's part of respecting every human being and it's part of man's place in nature. But now we go to point two, which is social responsibility. Social responsibility, again, just a few points to give you an understanding of how the moral economy is meant to be working. Two interesting points. One point in this atomized picture we're trying to draw here. Lost property. What is the fiqh of lost property? People often say, if you find money lying around, the best thing is to walk past it because the rules are very complicated. This is not correct. This is not correct. If you find property lying around and you feel someone might take it who is not the rightful owner, you are obliged to pick it up. You must pick up lost property. If you feel the rightful owner will not get it and you feel someone else will get it who will not give it its due, you must pick it up. Once you pick it up, what are you supposed to be doing with it? What you're supposed to be doing with it is put in some reasonable effort to find the owner. You owe that to the owner. And the scholars have a range of guidance on this. If it's perishable food, if it's a long-staying item, how long should you do this for? Even something small as a cucumber, it's food, right? It's sacred. It's going to rot. If you, can, if you could pick it up, if it's whole and well, and you can give it to someone who can eat it, you have to. And if it's going to perish, then, then you eat it or give it to somebody. Where is all of this coming from? Because in the moral economy, you realize the sanctity of property and the sanctity of human beings. What this topic is showing us 
is when you live in society, when you live amongst people, there is a contract. And what is the contract? Is I have to respect you. I cannot hurt you. I cannot harm you. And part of my respecting you is I have to respect your property. I might not know who you are, but you live in the community where I live, I have to look after you. And it goes down to respecting your 10 pound note, respecting your grocery that you dropped. That's part of the sacred economy. We respect and value and hold high the property of people. And we make sure it doesn't get um, discarded by the roadside if we feel someone's not going to see to its due. Now, if I can't find the owner after putting some reasonable effort, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to give it to somebody poor. That's it. What does this show as a principle in the moral economy? It is that we all as a collective have a responsibility to those who are not well-to-do in our midst. And in every community, there will be people who are not well-to-do. And that's from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has created a disparity so that we would form ties. And he says this again and again and again within the Holy Quran. So what does this imply? People who are not well-to-do, they're not on the bottom of the moral economy. They're actually at the top. And I'm going to show you different, different ways to understand this. Uh, we never look down on someone who hasn't got because we realize in the moral economy we didn't create our money. We were born with nothing and we leave with nothing. And we all know people with lots of degrees who don't have jobs, people with no degrees who are, who are billionaires, and we know everything in between. We know in the moral economy this whole world is Allah's. He gave it to us on a trust. And so the people who don't have, there's nothing deficient. Rather, the only deficiency is our deficiency towards them if we don't fulfill our responsibility to them. We are deficient. And so this first topic of the lost property is very interesting in this. And how do they understand this? Why are you giving it to the poor? It's two reasons. One is that the poor, in one sense, are the rightful owners of of this property because they're in need and this is the property of our collective community and no one right now is claiming it but it belongs to one of us, we just don't know who. So we give it to the rightful claimants who are in genuine need, this is the first part. And the second part is the understanding in the moral economy that you're still spending it on behalf of the owner because every owner in the moral economy would want their wealth to go to charity if they can't have it for themselves. This is the idea of the moral economy. We teach it through our schools, we teach it in our education. The importance of care for the needy as a fundamental right or duty to, to wealth ownership. So why do we give lost property to the poor? Because every moral owner would want that. They wouldn't want me to keep it if I'm not poor. And if I am poor, they wouldn't mind. That's the idea of our social contract. When you live as humans in the moral economy, you understand everyone's wealth is sacred. No one can walk by a diamond ring. No moral person can walk by a diamond ring on the road and just step over it as if it's got nothing to do with them. How dare you say it's got nothing to do with you when you live in a community where you want yourself to be respected? That's the moral economy. It's reciprocity of human dignity. You have no right to walk past the diamond ring. You have to pick it up. If it's a little biro pen, you can walk by it. Either the owner will come back or the owner doesn't care or something. That's about weighing these things. It all depends. Maybe we can debate the bi and afterwards, perhaps. But, uh, but th this is the point. This is the point of, of the moral economy, human dignity, the right of the poor, and the burden of living in, in a society. When you live together, there's a contract, and the contract is respecting wealth, respecting ownership, and respecting the status of the poor. This is the one point of this atomized journey. Another point in my ap atomized journey. We talked about the right, if you, if you go to the sea and you get the bucket, you've owned the water. You put the bucket, you collect the rain, you've owned the water. What if someone comes to you who's really, 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 really thirsty? Like, desperately thirsty, they really need that, that drink. And they ask you, can I please have some water from your bucket? Do you have the right to deny them? Our scholars of fiqh say you have no right. Because this private ownership of yours is based on 
uh, it's based on the fact that you took what was in nature, but every human being has a right to food. Every human being has a right to the basic necessities, and you cannot withhold. You cannot withhold. That's why this person who's thirsty, he's told by our fuqaha, our scholars of fiqh, that he must demand that water. He must take that water, and you have no right to deny. You are wrongdoing. So you can see when we talk about ownership and the right of the human being to own, it is an ownership with responsibility because it's an ownership of trust under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have side, side topics. You have a stream in your, in your land and people are thirsty and they're traveling in the wilderness. You cannot deny them access to your land if there's no other water available because you didn't create this stream. All human beings have a right to survive. And your wealth, your sense of ownership cannot prevent them from this, from the basics of food and drink. You have no right from the basics of food and drink. There's a subsidiary topic I'm going to add here, which our fiqh scholars say. Our fiqh scholars say, and I'm going to answer this because it's going to come into my conclusion. You have no right to create a company structure to own natural resources. And there's reasons they argue for this. Uh, because they say that the, the, the rule of natural resource, what is it? If I take it, it's mine. Just like I summarized right at the beginning with my, with my bucket and with my egg. If you take it, it's yours. So in a company structure, whoever took it, they owned it. The other partners don't own it. It's as simple as that. There is no company structure to take natural resources. Why is this really important? As I come back to my topic right at the end, it's because the world we live in today, as we're going to see, is run by these company structures, and I'll come to a second point about company structures, which withhold things that people need. And there's a problem of that within the moral economy. The basic things that human beings need, they can take, but you can't have a well, let me take my, my next point. My, my next point, then I'll, I'll be able to combine this topic. In the fiqh tradition, in Islamic sacred law, there is no such thing as a corporation. And what I mean by the corporation is an entity which, um, uh, where human beings are not bearing the risk for everything that company is doing. So in the Islamic sacred law, if we form a company structure, the people who bear all the risk of that company structure is me and my friend and my friend, whoever is a partner in that company. There's no such structure where we're employees and there's a board and there's a profit uh, and we are, um, and there's no, uh, there's no one person who's liable for that loss. Meaning I quit, I do all this dangerous dealing, then I, I quit, I say, oh, the company did it. It, it, it wasn't me. There's no such thing as a human being not being responsible for their actions. So every Islamic company structure, it's always a human being or a group of human beings that bear every single risk and every single damage. There's no structure, there's no entity called, oh, it's Tesco that did it, it wasn't me. Or it was Apple that did it. I wasn't doing anything with those uh, workers in China. You can't do that. There's always a human being at the end of every moral chain. That's very important in the moral economy. And these two things I said right now, the small points, but they would transform the world we live in today. Because in this moral economy, the human being is responsible. That's what it means to be dignified. What does it mean to be dignified? It means that you're responsible. We were placed on earth as the most dignified creature because we're gonna go back on judgment day and take task for all of this. That's what it means to be dignified. It means that you are responsible. Everything in the sacred law is about dignity tied with responsibility. In Islamic sacred law, you would never have corporations owning natural resources. You could only have structures which are cooperative. We are cooperative taking advantage of the water. We are cooperatively taking advantage of the oil. We are cooperatively taking advantage of the woods. We are cooperatively taking advantage of the trees or the animals or the fish. You can't have a fishing corporation. You would have people and you would have cooperative structures. And the world has been run like this. This is not a theory. The world has been run like this. And we'll come back to this conclusion right at the end. Just a small point for now about social responsibility in the moral economy. I'm going to my third topic. It's just a quick, quick tour. It's not a detailed tour. My third topic is about government. 
In the moral responsibility, in the moral economy, we take responsibility for our economy. We're not waiting for some government to take charge. I'll give you an example. People came to our Prophet والسلام, at a time when prices were rising within the market and things were getting more expensive than they used to be. And they said, The people said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, the prices have gone high. So fix the prices for us. Tell these sellers, you can't sell this at this price. Fix it. Make it easy for us. We're the buyers. Obviously, the buyers are saying this. قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمُسَاعِرُ الْقَابِضُ الْبَاسِطُ الْرَازِقُ Allah is the one who fixes the prices. He is the one who squeezes. He is the one who expands. He is the one who provides. This is the, the theology in the moral economy. Allah is the price fixer. Allah is the one behind this economy. It's an important thing to realize the sanctity of our dealings. The hadith continues, It's to answer these people saying, fix the prices. He said, I hope that I will meet Allah and nobody will have a claim of wrongdoing against me, neither in their blood nor in their wealth. Who am I? Messenger of Allah saying, who am I to interfere within these markets? That's part of understanding the sacred economy. It's not for governments. It's for governments only have to ensure fairness. We are the people who inhabit and run this economy. We the people. And I'll come back to this. Scholars have then debated, well, at what, you know, is there a time when you can fix a price? And there's debate on, you know, basic essentials and basic food and some rules about that. But the idea is governments aren't meant to be getting involved in the economy of people. It is the economy of the people because it's just a reflection of how we live together. That's all that trade is. It's how we are together. That's why in the sacred law, there's a lot of restrictions on taxation rights and all sorts. Because the point of the fiqh tradition is it gives government a box so that humanity can flourish. It's an important box. It's an important box to maintain fairness, security, and other matters. But we, the people, have to flourish in the moral economy. I won't say any more on that. Or one last thing, actually, which was about... Uh, it's a small point about hoarding. Uh, Abu Hanifa and his circle debated at what time is hoarding prohibited, when someone just holds goods and that makes the prices go up. Why did they have this debate? Because the fundamental point of dignity is you have the right that no one should be interfering with your property. No government should tell you when you sh should or should not sell. And that's why the fuqaha debated so hard. At what stage is hoarding a definite public harm? And at what level can government interfere to release that harm? All of this to show the sanctity of human ownership and the sanctity of human ties. And we have to learn, run, and live our moral economy. The last thing, although this is a few steps here, in my fixed sojourn, through this little, little atomized view, we've talked about the right to ownership, talked about social responsibility, we've talked about government is not the place which runs this economy. We run the economy. The government is there to ensure the fairness and the, uh, the protection of this economy. The last thing is now, how do we interact with each other now as people, us with each other? We either interact with exchange, or we interact with charity, or we interact with exploitation. Trade, zakat, riba. Three topics I want to look at within this sacred law. When it comes to trade, all the rules of trade, if you study fiqh, there's rules in trade. And the ulama say, if anybody is going to the market to trade, it's wajib upon them to learn the rules of trade. That's why the Prophet said, Ali salatu salam, and yuriddillah bihi khayran yufaqihu fid deen. Whoever Allah wants good for someone, he gives them understanding. Because Allah and His Messenger have a guidance in all these areas of our life. It is a great source of remorse to end your life and, not have had, and, to, and to have had the opportunity to learn and not to have learned. What it is, this guidance. Because the beneficiaries of this guidance is ourselves, in this life and in the next life. All the rules of trade, whatever they are, they come back to very, very simple principles. In the words of the Holy Quran, لا تأكل أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن تراض منكم. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا 
Allah says, don't take the wealth of each other unless it is a trade where both people are happy. That's it. The only right you ever have to the property of another human being, whatever the religion, whatever the group, the only right you have to another human being's property is trade. And the only trade you're allowed to do is a trade when both parties depart and they feel at ease, that this was a fair trade. That's why in, in a trade setting, the point is people negotiate. And, you, and everything that leads to a sort of taking advantage is, is interdicted. People should feel it's a fair exchange and they leave contented. That is sacred trade. Anything which implies bullishness, overpowering, forcing a price, taking advantage, this is unfair trade. And there's hadiths about this. Tijaratan an taradin. That's what the Quran says. A trade when both parties are in rida, they're in contentment. And the next injunction, wala taqtulu an fusakum. Don't kill yourselves. Look at this: the sanctity of wealth and blood. That's the entire topic today. As much as human beings are sacred, property is sacred, and that's what we have to respect in this moral economy. All the rules are about how do you ensure this fairness. So you say they talk about selling an item of value, an item you're allowed to use. So in the sacred law, Muslims are not allowed to sell wine, and it's an invalid transaction. The judge will invalidate it. But in the sacred law, non-Muslims are fine to sell wine because it's an item of property they're allowed to own in their legal traditions. So the idea is it should be something the parties are allowed to, in the sacred law, benefit from. And everything that leads to dispute is forbidden. You can't sell something you don't have. You can't sell something where there's uncertainty. You can't sell something without naming the price. You can't sell something without defining the good. Every detail in the sacred law is to make sure that trade shouldn't be a lead to dispute because it's a sacred exchange. We are forming society by exchanging together. It's a relationship of respect and taradi. Anything that leads to undermining that is interdicted. That leads to a troublesome trade, a worrying trade. We call this a facid trade. You should fix it somehow. And then the sacred law has a number of makruh, disliked, more immoral practices in trade. All of them are about taking advantage of the market. They talk about going out to the wilderness, getting the goods of the Bedouin, and then selling them in the market on a, on a, on a monopoly. Different, again, fine points in the atomized world of the jurists, but what it shows is anything, any trade practice, which shows uh, taking advantage of the market, forcing something on the market, taking advantage of people, leading to uncertainty, a practice that leads to dispute, all of this has to be avoided. That's part of being a Muslim in the market. And that means being a Muslim when dealing with each other. Moving on. When it comes to charity, when it comes to charity in the fiqh or the law tradition, the main charity that is discussed is zakat. In the chapter of Zakat, I just want to focus on a few things that tie in with the themes that I've been, di been discussing today. First of all, what kind of wealth is Zakat paid on? Zakat is paid on a wealth which is growing, not on your fixed assets. So it's, you know, your animals have bread, give one sheep to your neighbor. Your wealth has grown, give some money to your neighbor. Your ground has produced produce, give a little bit to your neighbor. That's the only wealth that Zakat is on. Zakat is not telling rich people you can't be rich. Zakat is not telling people your private property, the government has to know all about it. Zakat is just saying the little bit of increase, share it with your neighbor. Zakat is actually maintaining the sanctity of ownership, adding the duty of responsibility, and tying it in a way that's easy. Zakat is actually designed to be easy so that people fulfill their responsibility without feeling an unbearable burden. In the rules of Zakat, we're told that when the government used to collect zakat, the rules said the government can only collect the zakat that's public, which is the animal and land. We were told the government can never collect the zakat that's private, which is the money in your homes. Why did the, why did the fiqh tradition stress this so much? So no government would enter your house asking about your money. That's it. It's to protect the sanctity of your ownership. The whole moral economy is about the sanctity of the human being and their ownership. So the rules of zakat are built like that. You calculate what's in your house. You will be trusted because it's your neck if you, if, if you do it wrong. And it's your duty to your neighbor. And the government will facilitate, but will never enter your homes uh, to count this zakat. 
Another thing about zakat, which is an interesting thing about this economy, is zakat is only paid to Muslims. It's an important thing for us to reflect upon in this vision of the economy, because an economy, like I said, it's how we live together as human beings. What is this point of zakat implying? It is that part of the right of wealth, we've talked about the, the general right of the needy, part of the responsibility of wealth is it is meant to strengthen the tie within the community of faith. That's a right in wealth. That as we live in this economy, that faith should come together in community. That's why if you study the books of fiqh, every community should live within their faith community and follow their faith laws. If a Christian, if a Jewish couple come to a Muslim court in a fiqh book, they're told, go back to your Jewish court. Why are you coming to our court? We respect you. You, you have a community. Follow your laws. That's how the fiqh book sees this moral society. People are in faith communities. They are strengthening their faith communities with their wealth. They are connected together. They enjoy faith in community, and that's how people should live. Because faith, iman billahi ta'ala, is at the heart of human dignity. And that iman should be flourishing through our wealth. That's why zakat is paid Muslim to Muslim. It is not just now the right the poor have on the rich, but it is the right the believer has on the believer. And that's part of the rights of wealth. And it's a beautiful thing that people should live in the world in Iman and in communities of Iman. People should live in the world with ties of faith which are strengthened through wealth. That's just a little bit I wanted to say about charity, and we'll say a little bit more in the conclusion. What do we say about usury? Riba is the anti-zakat. The Quran contrasts zakat and riba twice in the Holy Quran. They are opposites. Riba is the last thing revealed to our Prophet والسلام, with the verses on riba. You could say riba is the anti-sharia. Usury is the anti-Islam. It's the anti-moral. It's the anti-zakat. It's the anti-dignified for reasons that we're going to see. What are the last verses revealed to our Prophet Right, the very last passages of riba, it goes as follows, just in translation, this is Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 278 to 281. This is not the whole passage, brother, just the last half of that passage. O believers, fear Allah and give up the usury. If you've lent on interest, don't ask the interest. Let it go now. You have to let it go. What do I mean by usury? In the most basic form, giving someone money and asking back for more. The more, you didn't do anything for it you didn't give them any service for it, that more is just taking advantage of their need. That's why usury is exploitative. It is exploitation. It's people who have money exploiting those who don't. Allah says, oh, you who believe, fear Allah and give up this usury. Don't ask for that extra. If you are truly believers, if you do not, then take notice of a war of Allah and his messenger against you. I, the law is against you. The law will not tolerate this practice. If you repent, you can take the principle that you lent. You will not be wronged and you should not wrong anybody else. If somebody is in difficulties, leave them alone until they can pay you. Don't use debt as a reason to enslave another human being. And if you forgive the debt, that's even better for you. If you know, and then the final verse revealed in the, to the Holy Prophet, والسلام, according to most of our scholars, fear the day when you'll be returned to Allah Every soul shall be paid in full what it earned, and no one is going to be wronged. That's the last verse revealed to our Prophet, والسلام, according to most of our scholars, and it's the conclusion of the verses of riba. So like I said, the moral economy is what it means to be a human being on earth, is what it means to be a Muslim on earth. Undermining it is the war against Allah and His Messenger. That's why we all bear a responsibility to understand these principles, live by them, and build communities by them. Why is usury the antithesis of this Islamic message? Because if you look at the world it has created, which is the world that we inhabit, it is a world of bondage. Everywhere you look, people are enslaved. Everywhere you look, nations are enslaved. What is this economy we inhabit? It's built on a simple principle that at any one moment in time, there is more debt than there is money. That's it. That's, that, that, that's what riba is, right? I gave you money, I want more. So the whole economy means there's more money, sorry, there's more debt than there's money. That's what our economy is. What does that mean to us as human beings? What, just have a think, what does that mean? 
it means that to pay back that debt, we have to create money from the world because there's not enough money to pay back the debt. You have to somehow create money. You have to make an excuse to create money. What is the excuse? Chop down all the trees. What is the excuse? Fish out all of the fish. What is the excuse? Kill all the elephants for their trunks. What is the excuse? Do whatever you can to create money to pay off today's debt, but then tomorrow we'll bring more debt. This riba economy won't end till everything is done. It's insatiable. It is insatiable. There is no way to satiate this beast. Charity creates community. Charity creates ties of, of connection because I feel responsible about you. Being poor, if I, being poor is not a deficiency. It's my deficiency if I don't look after you. Remember I said that. The poor are at the top of the moral economy. And as we fulfill that right and we appreciate them, for receiving our charity, we build ties. As we build ties, we build society. The moral economy is a world where you actually feel dignified living in it. The economy of the immoral is a world where you're just out for yourself, worrying how you're going to survive. And I'll come back to a little bit about this in our conclusion. If you go back to the Holy Quran, why am I calling all of these activities sacred? Because we saw already that even the day and night is moving to facilitate this economy of ours, our society. We have a responsibility to build moral society as human beings. But not only is this a sacred act here on earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this language of trade and buying and selling and hiring to describe our relationship with Him, the ultimate relationship of this whole world under God. Look at these following verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Holy Quran What's the word he uses to describe the rewards that we are given? The word for reward, we, we say is ajr. I want ajr. I'm going to feed the poor. I want the ajr in it, right? Ajr in Arabic does not mean reward. You know, reward in English is like I returned someone's wallet and they're going to gift me something to thank me. That's not what the word ajr means. It's not a gift. It's not a thanking. The word ajr means a wage. And what's a wage? It is something somebody deserves. If I withhold your wage, I'm wronging you. I have to give you your wage. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call this reward a wage? Because he's honoring us. He owes us absolutely nothing. He made us. There's nothing we've given him. He owes us nothing. But he created us to be dignified. وَلَقَدَ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have ennobled Bani Adam. The angels prostrated. They came to earth with all of these abilities. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ennobles us in our relationship with Him. And He says to us, My promise with you is true. If you do what the messengers have told, you deserve what I'm going to give you. Although you don't, in reality of the case, deserve anything from Him. Does He owe you something because you prayed to Him? How? You prayed to Him because you owed Him everything. And but yet He tells you, no, no, because you prayed, I will give you something that you can expect from me, an ajr. كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ وَعْدًا مَسْؤُولًا this is a promise he's made that you can ask for it. Where is my promise? That's how the language goes. It's to ennoble the children of Adam with this language of trade. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says even more than that. This is the ajr. What does he say more than that? Inna Allah hashtara min al-mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al-jannah. We have a trade relationship with Allah. What does he say? Verily Allah has bought from the believers their selves and their wealth so they can have and he'll give them jannah in return when you go to the market to buy something what is more valuable to you the thing you're buying or the thing you're paying necessarily the thing you're buying is more valuable because you're paying something of yours to get it allah is saying he's buying you you are valuable not the jannah in this verse allah wants you every human being allah is saying i want you I want you, I'm interested in you, you're valuable to me. And Allah is saying, I'll give the Jannah in return. Just give me yourself. Look at this very beautiful language of how this sacred activity of trade is the language that Allah has chosen to speak to us in because it ennobles us and it makes us special because we were created for that. Allah says, I want you. In Allah He'll pay Jannah in return for this. Just give me you. And he says right at the end, 
Be really happy. Be overjoyed. Imagine when you go to, you go to the shop and there's a car that should be sold for 20,000, you got it for 10. You said, I'm from Bangladesh and we're from the village and my uncle knows your uncle and brother. And you, imagine how happy you'd be to get this car at half price. You'd be over the moon. Allah is saying to the believers, be over the moon. فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا Bushra is the joy that it shows on your skin. It's like you're glowing. Be overjoyed. Because this is the best sale anyone could ever have made. The sale to Allah. Selling yourself. Look at this beautiful exchange in Surah Al-A'raf about how this language merges with the reality. For those who believe and do righteous works, we never burden a soul more than, more than it can handle. Meaning everything you were asked to do, you really could do it. Those who did these works are in gardens ever ranking, ever, ever living. We've removed from their hearts any dislike towards each other. They're in a real community, and that's what, we try to moral, that's what the moral economy was here for. So we, as much as possible, live together in peace. And that's what the everlasting life is. And what do they say? They say, all praises for Allah who guided us to this. We couldn't be guided if he didn't guide us. So what are they saying when they see all of that garden? This has nothing to do with us. We didn't have the guidance. His is the praise. And then they say, لَقَدْ جَاءَتْ رُسُلُ رَبِّنَا بِالْحَقِّ And then they remember the messengers. And they say, look, As-salatu as-salamu alayka ya Rasulullah is where we started from. They remember the Rasul because he brought all of this. They were truthful and this is the proof. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not happy that this should be the end of the exchange in Jannah. Wanudu, It will be proclaimed over them. Tilkumu al-jannatu urithtumuha bima kuntum ta'amaloon. This is the Jannah that you've inherited because of what you used to do. It's that language of trade again, or ennoblement. So no, you deserve this. The believers will say, because that's how they live, and that's the reality of this case. We deserve nothing, and we've done nothing, and we've not been guided through anything. And Allah, through His kindness, through His ennobling, which is at the heart of our presentation today, He, he will make sure it's proclaimed, no, you deserve this. You deserve it because I want you to feel that you've deserved this. And I want you to feel that what you did for me on earth was worth all of this. That's the beauty of this sacred language of trade when Allah uses it for us and when you zoom out of the whole picture it governs the whole everything. This sacred language of trade. That's why it's a moral economy. If we summarize everything and conclude we've talked about that our purpose is to represent Allah on earth. We've talked that part of that is cultivating the treasures of this earth and building civilization. And that civilization is on principles and the heart of it is the dignity of the human. Every human's right to own. And every human, rights, every human being's right and duty of social care, balanced within the teachings of the sacred law. That power structures should not interfere in your economy except to protect it. And you are the ones that are meant to flourish in your community-led economy. Charity as the most beautiful thing to do with your wealth and as the tie between you and your faith community. One of the duties of wealth is to strengthen Iman, to bring us together to worship Allah as a community of faith. Usury as the antithesis of this. But in the last few moments, where does all of this leave us today? I said right at the beginning, we're clashing the human from the material. Let's take a moment and look at today's world. In today's world, we have, like I've described, our financial system What's running the system? It's not a human being, it's just a concept. Man made a concept called debt. And that economy of debt is running man. Man is enslaved to his concept. If you look at these corporate structures, man made a, a structure with a concept called profit. And profit runs these structures, not human beings. If you're not serving profit, you get fired. If the prophet's not happening, it gets disbanded. It's a structure run by a concept, enslaved to a concept. Look at normal life. What is, where are human beings today in normal life? Look at the average, you know, just reflect on what an average human being is going through today in, in a place like Cambridge or London or elsewhere. 
what you have, you have corporations making a lot of profit. This is their bumper season off of natural resources where other people are crying because they can't pay their bills. What you have, you have households of parents, both of them must work, otherwise they can't pay for their little, sh their shelter, which often is not even that big or fancy, which they have a human right to, and then the family is what it is. Stress, no time, always busy, always trying to keep up, you got the bills, you got the debts, no time for the kids, kids are doing, this. where is this coming from? It's not because people are bad or people don't care or family is not important anymore. It's the economy is an economy of bondage. People are enslaved to what man has made. Think of any, any movie where you create the machine and the machine kills the humans, that's it already. It's not science fiction, it's here. This is the world, we all inhabit it. We're breathing in it and we're feeling it. Think of the, 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 the life when we're all in this sort of moment. What happens to our religion? We don't have time. We don't have community. We're atomized. The, the economy of charity is an economy of surplus. The economy of riba is an economy of scarcity. You're always scared. You're always in competition. You're always thinking, how can I make more money just to get by? You don't have community. You don't have time. You don't have uh, cooperative models. So what do you have? Anxiety, fear, depression. Huzan, uh, gham. Those are the words of this economy. And then the final question is, were we created, was life breathed into man only to be in bondage to these man-made structures? Because that's what life is. It's a life of bondage. If you really zoom out, we have wonderful moments in between. I don't wish to paint a dark picture. We have, we have beautiful spaces where we live in dignity. But if you just zoom out of the entire picture, a lot of us are living this lives of you have to go to school, you've got to do this, you've you got to get this job, and you've got to pay for this, and no time, and this, and no time. And where, where was your time in all of this? This is a result of an economy, of an immoral economy. The secular economy is shirk. That, that's all it is. It's not tawheed, it's shirk. It's saying God is the thing that you made. You made the debt, you made the profit, you made the system, now you worship it, now you bow down in front of it. That is the economy. Rib'i ibn Amir, he was the, one of the companions. He went to see Rustum, the head of this Persian commander. And he stood in front of him, and the Persian had his fineries, and Rib'i had his basics. And he said to describe himself, لَقَدْ إِبْتَعَثَنَ اللَّهُ لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادِ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ He said, we are a people that Allah has sent us forth to liberate from worshipping man to worshipping God. We are a people... We've been sent forth to liberate humans from worshipping slaves to worshipping the Lord of the slaves. Islam is liberation. The economy I've described today existed. It was real. It's not make-believe. And it's not in the 800 golden era Harun Rashid somewhere in the past. Read about Istanbul 300 years ago. Read about Cairo 400 years ago. Read about Damascus 500 years ago. Read about Delhi uh, before the British came, read about Islamic civilization. It was a civilization of surplus. What do I mean by surplus? Of cooperative, of sharing, of spending in human ties, and the economy grew. It grew wholesomely. Zakat is wholesome growth. What we're discussing as the moral economy is the right of every human being to enjoy. And we have been sent forth as the people of Rasulullah to give people this dignity. To give people this dignity of this economy. And in the fiqh, whether they're Muslims or not is not the point. It's that they have the right to be respected, they have the right to trade fairly, and they have the right to have the sanctity of their human life. So we then have a mission. We've been sent forth. And we have to come up with solutions as a community. And we don't have a huge sphere of power, we might feel sometimes, but within our spheres we have to build. Within our spheres we have to bring this iz back to this earth because it's the iz that human beings were made for and it's the amana that Allah gave us as being followers of Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So all I'll say is in very, 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 very short, within our spheres we have to think. You can't exit the economy but you can create cooperative models of, of ownership. And there are beautiful products now 
of real, wholesome Islamic economic products that are coming out now in the market. Look at them. For investing Islamically within the bubble, cooperative house ownership within the bubble, and form communities. These centers, these mosques are safe havens because no one owns the space I'm sitting on except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what made this a mosque. No one can say you don't, you don't have a right to sit in the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Use this to your advantage. It's a free space. Use it to create community. Make community sacred. Remind people of the sanctity of their ties. The ties within the faith community are the most sacred of all, and all human ties are meant to be sacred. Think about your trade and your businesses. There are people discussing how to make a Muslim business networks, not only for profit, but for dignity, for the is of Allah and His Messenger. Trade is sacred. Charity is sacred. Protect your charities. Think of how you can use it to expand these ties. We have more spheres than we think, and there are more people thinking about this than we know. It's not just a Muslim problem, it's a human problem. But we have something, and we have an amana, and we have a sacred law, and we have a sharia. Ah. And the sharia, ah, all it means is a path to water. So we have to take ourselves and take humanity to drink. We might not get there, but we have to take the steps, and we, ha and we have the ability to do this. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, to inspire us with gratitude for the blessings of Iman, for the blessings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama. We should spend copious salawat on the one who brought us out and showed us a way of safety and, and, and sanctity. To this Holy Quran, all of this is just an expansion of what the Holy Quran teaches, and it's a book that we're reciting this month. I ask Allah to guide us, to forgive us, to pardon us our shortcomings, and to, and to guide people through us a new way of being in this world, a way that has gone and passed, and we have to bring it again. Medina in Cambridge, Medina Rasulullah in London, Medina Rasulullah, wherever you go, Medina Rasulullah is with you. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ وَصَلَى اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدِ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصْوَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُ اللَّهِ السلام عليكم. This Ramadan, we're offering you the chance to have your own piece of Cambridge Central Mosque in your own home. Beautifully framed original brick from our award-winning building with an engraved plaque featuring a name of your choice. This is available to the first 300 of you taking advantage of our unique automated system to donate day by day this Ramadan so you can maximize the blessing of each day of this special month, inshallah. I'll be personally presenting this rare gift to you at an in-person ceremony right after Ramadan. Remember the Holy Prophet wasallam, said, the most beloved of deeds to Allah are those that are consistent, even if small. So this month, let's fast, pray, recite Qur'an, and donate day by day. Shahrul Abdul.